the next web. How are you doing? Which ones of you work in tech? Which ones of you believe that tech is going to change the world for the better? Which ones of you believe that already this had happened? You know, you guys are so important. You guys are so important. And there's one thing that I'm pretty much convinced all of you need in order to get your jobs done. And that is energy. No energy, no tech. So we're going to talk about energy a little bit. My personal motto is dream, develop, do. Why dream? Because I think that we can dream things that we deem impossible. We can time travel. We can fly in our dreams. And I am convinced that we can bring these dreams into realities if we put in the effort of developing them, if we persevere, if we go on and build up knowledge, if we spend time failing and failing and failing and failing until we succeed, we can bring our dreams into reality. My story starts in Niger. The boy in the middle is me. Next to me is my brother, Omid. Next to me on the other side is Amadou, our neighbor. We're watching television in a small town called Dosso. Which ones of you have been in Niger? That's, that's not many of you. It's, which means I want to talk to you after this, uh, after this talk. I grew up there because my parents were development workers. And as you can see, we're watching television. Watching television in Niger is a big thing. We had, in our town, two televisions in the 80s. We had broadcasts in Niger three times per week for one hour, and we could watch them if we had electricity at that moment, because we had power outages every day. Still today in Niger, 14% of the people only have access to energy, which means that 86% of the people living there cannot do much with tech. They have to spend up to 50% of their waking hours to fulfill their very basic needs, finding wood, for instance, to cook on. That is half of their waking hours they cannot spend on earning an income, they cannot spend on getting an education, and cannot spend on finding Pokemon. That's reality for people in Niger. Not only in Niger, because in, in Sub-Saharan Africa alone, we're seeing 700 million people living in energy poverty, and worldwide, we're looking at 43% of the world's population, 2.9 billion people living in energy poverty. When I was 11, we returned to the Netherlands, and after a couple of years, I was to choose an education. And knowing all this about energy, I had to choose something within that line. So I chose to learn something about electric guitars. I went to conservatory and became a musician. Now, that's a weird choice, but it helped me, and it really defined the path in my life for, for quite a bit. Because being a guitarist, uh, eventually I was invited to come over to the US and play there. And I did that for about two seasons. And one of these tours that I did in the late 90s led me into a place named Silicon Valley. So there I was as a musician in the late 90s in Silicon Valley. And I was experiencing this entire boom of, of, of all these awesome, awesome tech companies. And, and it blew me away. I flew back to the Netherlands and started up an internet company. So this was 99. And basically, we could do anything. You know, If you could prove that you'd physically been in Silicon Valley and you could spell out HTML without any mistakes in these four letters, then you, 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 you were regarded as somebody who really had something to say about the internet. So we built up the company, grew very quickly. And then in 2003, it went bust uh, and, and pretty much you know, had to restart again. And that was where I started to think about what, what should I do, actually, with my life? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at being busy, but is it worthwhile? And it was only then that I was reminded of the importance of energy in our lives. And in 2006, I became director of an energy supply company in the Netherlands. And I was a total newcomer to this business. And now this energy company wasn't doing too well, so that's probably why they hired me. You know, somebody with a music education knows a lot about chaos and poverty. So that's how I got to work there. I started to ask my colleagues all these very basic questions, such as, what is energy? And the answers that I got weren't exactly clear. Barcelona office said this. 
we don't know what energy is. Now, if we don't know what energy is, how can we tell whether somebody is using a lot of it or just a little bit? How can we know whether somebody is really conscious about it or not? We are disconnected from our product, and we needed to do something about that. Eventually, I found out that energy is defined as the ability to do work. My favorite kind of energy is food, because it enables me to work personally. Energy sets things in motion. With energy being the ability to do work, it is also the ability to create value. It is also the ability to progress. You could say that whatever we touch, whatever we use, whatever we produce exists thanks to some flow of energy somewhere along the line, which means that energy is the currency of the real economy, the economy we can touch, the economy we can eat, the economy that we can live in. How is the real economy doing? In 2007, this picture was shown to me by the former director of an Irish energy institute, Lawrence Stout. I looked at it, and it completely changed my paradigm on energy. What we are looking at is fossil fuel consumption throughout our existence as human beings. Once you zoom out, you see the magnitude of the thing that we're doing here. This specific image taught me that whenever we talk about alternative energy, we think about sun and wind and geothermal heat, and we're wrong. Alternative energy in the history of mankind is oil and coal and gas. Conventional energy is renewable. We've always used it. We will always use it. We, as humanity, are around here. We started to consume more and more fossil fuels around the Industrial Revolution, around 1850. Why? Because it saved us a lot of time. We could concentrate a tremendous amount of energy into a little bit of the Earth's crust. We could set it on fire, and we collectively became pyromaniacs, and it helped us because it propelled humanity to that stage where we are right now, working in tech, wearing nice clothes, being in holes with lighting and everything. That is all thanks to fossil fuels. And now, I believe that we are using the next revolution, which is the tech revolution, to make the entire way back to renewable resources without losing the time that we have won along the line. There are only three options why we are going to make this entire way down. And one is fossil fuels are gone. Two is we're gone. I don't like that option. The third one is we find something better, and this is exactly where we are right now we find something better. A world that runs on 100% renewable resources is not so much a choice, it's inevitable. So learning about all these numbers, I became angry at first, and I wanted to do something against the old world. And then I read a book by Buckminster Fuller. I don't know which ones of you know him. Read his book if you have three years off. You know, it takes a lot of time. It's, it's very dense in information, but it's, it's awesome. And Buckminster Fuller says, you don't change things by fighting the existing reality. If you want to change something, you better build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. This is by far the best way to invest your energies in, too. So what new models, then? I'm going to give you three examples. The first one is the energy internet. We all know about the internet. We all know that we are all interconnected in a certain way. And with energy, we're going to make the same movement. We're coming from a centralized, centralized model where, where you have a coal-fired plant and then a couple thousand or, or millions of, of, of clients on the other end. And you see that the power is concentrated there. And from a centralized model, we're moving into a decentralized model, such as uh, with solar panels. This is the roof of Rotterdam Central Station, which is dividing the power in a new way. But from the decentralized model, we're going to build something else even. We're going to build a distributed model where everything is connected with everybody at any moment. This is the era where we're not talking about consumers anymore, because with every machine, with every user, you cannot tell whether it's consuming or whether it's generating or storing something into the grid. This is the distributed energy internet which means that we're not going to talk about consumers anymore, because consumers can only exist in a linear economy because they're using something up. And just like with the internet, most of the content is generated by the user. So we're going to look at the prosumer. And already we're seeing some examples here. 
such as um, we drive solar in the city of Utrecht, which is the first bi-directional electric vehicle charging infrastructure, which means that your car, whether, um, uh, depending on demand or supply, can either be a supplier of energy from its batteries or withdrawing energy from the grid. And this is all going to be facilitated by a variety of blockchain technologies that are going to enable us to communicate with each other and validate all these transactions. The second example is phones. Why phones? Well, three years ago, I went back to Niger, to the country where I grew up. This is the school that I used to go to, a school, Ecole Tondo Bon in Dosso, which still has no access to energy. This is my brother and I in front of our classroom, and we tried to reproduce the picture, but the window shrunk a little bit. I went inside the classroom, and I did one staggering discovery. Life with no access to energy, to electricity, still still made the people in this school decide that they needed an application named Excel. So they reproduced it in an analog manner. Which ones of you use this kind of Excel? <laughs> That's not too many of you. Kudos. It takes a lot of time, though. So this is life with no access to energy. I went outside my classroom, and I ran into my old teacher, Monsieur Torodo. Nothing had changed about him in 26 years' time except his mobile phone, exactly. And I asked him, if 86% of the people in this country have no access to energy, how can everybody run around with their mobile phones? How would you charge these things? And he said, I'll show you. And he took me to this little kiosk on the corner of the street, and he showed me that they charge their phones with diesel. There's a diesel generator on one end, there's AC outlets on the other, you're going to wait there for about an hour. Your phone is going to be charged. You're going to pay for that. And since you're there for an hour, this entrepreneur is going to sell you a drink also. That's his business model. You're going to see these kiosks on every corner of the street in sub-Saharan Africa. I think that it's a sign of poverty if people know the price of diesel on a daily basis. And by now, we're seeing that the revolution is taking place in Niger already, because all these kiosks are being converted into solar-powered kiosks. For lack of an electricity grid in Niger, the mobile phone operators had no other option than to have their grid powered by the sun. This is leaping forward. The first street lighting in the town that I grew up in is powered by the sun. This is fundamental democratization of the power to create value. This is democracy of the ability to progress, the ability to do work and to, to add something to society. The sun is shining abundantly on all our heads. By now, 1,437 times the amount of energy that the entire humanity is consuming hits the Earth in the form of sunlight every day. And it doesn't discriminate. The sun doesn't care whether you're poor, you're rich. It doesn't care where you're living. It doesn't care who you are. It will shine on your heads. You could say that the sun already is providing us a basic income in the form of energy. We just need to learn to connect to it. The third example is the Sun Glacier. And this one is actually devised by a friend of mine, Apfer Hege from The Hague. He thought, would it be possible to create ice and fresh water in the middle of the desert? It's a crazy idea, but he wanted to use the power of the sun to get it done. He has this installation of solar panels that is generating electricity, that is cooling a fluid running underneath these panels, which will attract the moist in the air and actually freeze it until there is ice. And already in Mali, they're test casing, and it works. At 50 degrees Celsius, with only 10% humidity in the air, they are creating fresh water and ice. These are moonshot ideas that I believe will change the world and enable us to connect to the abundance of nature. And this is going to drive us into a new culture, a new culture where it's not about fighting over that last little bit of resources that we have, a culture where abundance drives us to actually celebrate the diversity that, that we have and be more than just the sum of all parts. This is a culture of collaboration. This is a culture that goes way beyond contest. I believe that energy being such a basic need should be a universal right for every human being. If everybody has access to energy, it means that this seat is going to be taken 
which means that this girl in Kenya is going to be able to pursue her Nobel Prize that she so well deserves because she's so friggin' intelligent. I want to close this speech with a little film by Ray and Charles Eames from my birth year, 1977. They made it because IBM asked them to, and it deals with the powers of 10. You see Ray and Charles, which ones of you know him? Amazing architects, the plywood chair, go and look them up. They're philosophers, they're designers, they're visionaries, and they decided to film themselves having a picnic by the shores of Lake Michigan in Chicago. So there they are in a one by one meter square. And every 10 seconds, they're going to zoom out by a power of 10, which means that now you're looking at a square of 10 by 10 meters, and slowly you're seeing the correlations between our little economies and the ecology that surrounds us. And the more we zoom out, the more we see what influence we, as little critters, have on the Earth's surface. You're seeing squares. You know that humans are the only organism that produces squares? It's a strange thought, right? And you're seeing waste. We're also the only organism that produces waste that not, no other organism is actually regarding as food. We need to do something about that. And the more we zoom out, the more you see how much influence we have on this Earth. And then we're going to zoom out even more. And by now, the square is about 100 by 100 kilometers. Now, where is the human influence? Where is the human influence if you're thinking about the magnitude of the universe that we are a part of? We don't own the Earth. We live on the Earth. We cannot save the Earth. We can save ourselves. And I believe that our mission is not so much to try and balance economy and ecology, because that would mean that the Earth and us are equals. No, we have to fit our little economies into a huge and, and in, infinite ecology. That is our role. I would love to invite you guys, because energy is so fundamental, to dream, to dream wildly, and to develop your dreams into actions, because in the end, there's no substitute for action. And I want to thank you for being here, and have an awesome day. Thank you.